I'd like to introduce Matt Blaze. He told us he's a professor at UPenn where he does various kinds of hackery. And uh, I have to say, one of the very few times I'm ever going to say this, if there's an academic paper with this man's name on it and you like what he's talking about, you probably want to read it, uh, especially all this fun B25 stuff, but quite a bit of other things. It's very interesting. And uh, just the, the silly things this man does to get himself in, uh, in trouble but somehow gets out of trouble, I, I really can't can't speak too highly of his work. So today we'll be talking about doo -doo -doo, SIG Int for the rest of us. So thank you very much, Matt. OK, so thanks. Uh, hope you can hear me. Hi, morning. Congratulations for making it up before, making up before the crack of noon, which is an accomplishment, um, at least for me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work I did in my lab with a bunch of incredibly talented other people, uh, including Sandy Clark, Mouse, who I think everybody uh, either knows or should know, and she's around somewhere, uh, and Travis Goodspeed, a, you know, a hacker of ill repute who is also around, um, and, as well as uh, um, Perry Metzger, Zach Wasserman, and Kevin Zhu, who are undergraduates. Uh, um, in, in my lab. Uh, so I got this grant from uh, the National Science Foundation. There's nobody from the National Science Foundation here, right? Okay, so they gave us this, this pile of money um, to look at security in open telecommunications networks. And basically that, that kind of meant, I think they thought that that meant um, cell phone networks. And I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting to look at. Um, but we decided to start out by looking at um, other kinds of wireless, um, um, wireless communications networks. And I just decided to, uh, you know, kind of on a lark, to look at the security standards used by public safety two-way radios, um, uh, in particular the P25 standard. And um, so, you know, that, that was kind of an excuse to buy lots of RF equipment and, um, and, and start playing with it uh, in the lab and putting antennas up and, and doing all sorts of fun stuff um, that, you know, you kind of, otherwise, you, you don't normally get to call research. And, uh, um, you know, as soon as um, I put in a receiver, we turned it on and uh, noticed that we could demodulate a digital signal, and there's this like surveillance operation going on, literally like two blocks away, and they're reading off license plates and describing people. And I could look out the window and see the people they were describing. And this was like literally in the first 45 minutes after unpacking this uh, um, uh, the fancy pants piece of uh, uh, RF uh, intercept gear that, that we had picked up. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I'll bet they think that this is secure. Um, and so what is this? Um, so there's a, a system called uh, APCO Project 25, which is the successor to something called APCO Project 16. Um, so uh, I'm not sure why, uh, what happened to nine of them uh, uh, in, in there along the way. This is a, uh, the, the current standard for digital two-way radio for public safety and federal users. Um, and so there are two kind of dominant standards for digital land mobile radio. One of them is DMR, a lot of hams like DMR. Um, a, an incompatible but remarkably similar standard is called uh, APCO Project 25. It uh, started a little bit earlier, um, started, the standards uh, started in the early 1990s, and, uh, they, and the intention was to be a drop-in replacement for analog FM radio, which means um, narrow band channels, 12 and a half kilohertz channel spacing, um, and some modulation technique that would fit into the same size channel as an existing um, narrow band FM, <clears throat> but also allow it to be digital, allow a messaging service, but the primary application being the same kind of two-way voice. Okay, so this is first of all an interesting limitation right from the beginning, because if you were designing a digital communication system completely from scratch, and you just had all the spectrum in the world that you might want, um, you would probably 
uh, prefer a spread spectrum style option, which has all sorts of properties uh, that are, uh, in, in a lot of ways, much more favorable than individual channelized spectrum use. But this is you know, starting out with a kind of legacy problem. But this is the, uh, the state of the art. Now, they added, later on, cryptographic security options to uh, the P25 standard. So this was uh, you know, not exactly an afterthought, but it wasn't the par part of the initial standard. So they kind of figured out the bearer channels and all of the, the basic signaling and the modulation and the uh, vocoder. And then they said, oh, we should definitely get a working group to come up with crypto standards for this. So throughout the 1990s, they were kind of grafting on more and more crypto standards. And then 2000, kind of the first uh, encrypted versions of P25 equipment started uh, to become commercially available. Um, uh, on, a, on a wide scale and deployed on a wide scale. Um, and the encryption standards, the security standards group uh, working on P25 continues its work uh, today. So this was not something that security was really designed in top to bottom from the beginning. So here we are, a group of radio geeks at a security geek oriented conference. And you can kind of, uh, you know, from the beginning, your skepticism should be, you know, uh, heavily uh, um, uh, attuned. Okay, so here's some you know examples of typical uh, P25. This is a Motorola um, XTS 5000. That's the radios that the goons use uh, um, here. So this is kind of a, a first generation or second generation of the subscriber equipment that we, that's available. Motorola is by far the dominant vendor, although there are other vendors of the equipment. Um, Motorola is also, interestingly, the only vendor that produces key loaders. So if you want to use the encryption option, you are, you're, you're, you're kind of bought into Motorola as it is, because they're the only, they're the only company that actually makes the equipment that can load keys into the, uh, into the radios. Um, so there's a fairly wide range of equipment. All of it is shockingly expensive. Um, the, um, you know, here's... Uh, these can be bought on the surplus market for, you know, in, in the neighborhood of uh, 500 bucks. Um, this is the current latest and greatest version of this. This is an all band that is VHF, UHF, 700, 800 um, megahertz um, uh, P25 radio. Uh, it has speakers on both sides and a keypad and a fancy display. And, you know, it costs some shockingly large amount of money. Uh, but it can, you know, interoperate with, with anything. So there's a fairly wide range of, of equipment available. And, you know, they look like walkie-talkies from police movies in the 1980s um, because they're all kind of big and clunky. Okay, now, um, the P25 is intended not just, is intended primarily for public safety users. That's the sort of, uh, and like, so police, fire, ambulance services, not all of them need security options. And the basic uh, model uh, for it, you know, is assuming things like traffic analysis and so on, even for the encrypted users, are not a particular threat. Um, but in fact, uh, if you kind of poke around, you can see that, well, here's a, an encrypted radio standard that exists, and you can just buy off-the-shelf equipment, and it has some security options. So it has more users than it was, uh, more different kinds of users than it was designed for. Um, here's a picture from, um, uh, I believe this was from Afghanistan. And if you look really closely, you can see one of those XTS 5000s on the front of that um, warfighter. Um, here's a photo uh, from a White House event. Uh, this is the back of a, whoops, uh, back of a Secret Service agent. Um, who has a P25 radio in her evening gown um, uh, with one of those little uh, uh, earphones. So these are used by everything from the military to the Secret Service to you know, pretty much all of the federal uh, law enforcement agencies, um, but also you know, local police and fire and so on. Um, P25, by the way, can work with both trunked and conventional um, systems. Um, so uh, you can kind of drop it into a trunk system, or you can just drop it into conventional repeater uh, uh, channelized options. It has both. For the most part, um, uh, state and local is using trunk, uh, using trunk systems more than non-military federal. 
Um, military is using chiefly trunk systems. Uh, federal law enforcement is using chiefly conventional systems, although uh, you know, this varies based on area. So how does this work? OK, so basically, um, you have an existing narrow band channel. And so the first question is, how much bandwidth can you fit in there digitally? And they're being fairly conservative in that they're using a um, 4,800 symbols per second. Those are two-bit symbols. So that's uh, 9,600 uh, bits per second for the encoding, which pretty comfortably fits into a 12 and a half uh, kilohertz uh, channel if you um, uh, kind of do the, the um, uh, Nyquist uh, math. Um, and it can kind of coexist relatively comfortably with analog FM in that it um, uh, you know, uh, has a pretty similar shape of the curves and the spillover to, to adjacent channels. So the vocoder for the audio is um, a, a proprietary system called IMBE. Um, most uh, DMR and so on is using AMBE. Uh, this is very, very similar, except it's incompatible. That's its main difference. Um, but it's you know, fundamentally very similar. The audio sounds very the same. It does a respectable job of replicating human voice um, in uh, 9,600 uh, bits per second. Um, interestingly, it really, really, really wants to be implemented in hardware. Um, uh, if you do a software implementation, you need a pretty fast computer to, uh, to, to keep up with the um, uh, audio streaming, particularly on the decoding side. Um, so you, you really want hardware to be able to just do the vocoder uh, um, digital to analog uh, conversion for that. Um, the way they do this is uh, they div, uh, basically have um, a train of uh, voice frames that are each um, 1,728 bits long, which, uh, if you divide this up, is 180 milliseconds of audio. So every 180 milliseconds of audio is kind of separately encoded into these uh, two voice frames that they've got. Now, it's not quite that simple. In fact, there are two kinds of these voice frames called a logical data unit one and a logical data unit two. They both contain 180 milliseconds of audio. The difference is that half of the metadata that's thrown along with it is in the first one and half is in the second one, and they keep repeating. And the idea is that after two of these frames, you've now got enough information to start decoding uh, the rest of it, and you have all the metadata that's associated with it. Now, another interesting kind of design constraint, and this is no surprise to radio geeks, but is a surprise to computer security and protocol design geeks, is that this is designed, even though we call these things two-way radios, this is a one-way protocol, right? This is a broadcast-oriented protocol. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stating the obvious kind of slowly, partly because I'm a professor and that's what I do for a living, but, uh, but also because this will be important as we go forward. When you're designing a security protocol, almost all of the security protocols that we design you know, involve two-way handshakes between the um, initiator and the responder. And we, we tend to design protocols in which I say, here's what I'm about to send you. Here's my key material. Send me, some, send me yours back. Oh, yes, we're happy to communicate. Now we are, we've done our handshake, and we are synced up. Uh, and that, um, almost everything that we know how to design starts with the premise that you can do round trips between the, the sender and the receiver. Um, here, even though all of the receivers have the capability to transmit, we're operating on a broadcast model in which you basically put stuff over the air, and it is up to the recipient to pick uh, out uh, everything they need to decode it um, without any round trips um, with you. And that's partly so that you don't have to know who all the recipients are in advance, um, and you, you have kind of a, a, a broad standard broadcast model. Now, there are a few things that do involve round trips for the messaging protocols that, that are built on top of this. But chiefly, this is basically a one-way protocol for two-way radio. Um, OK, so how does security get grafted onto this? 
Um, okay, first of all, there is no public key cryptography at all, and that's unsurprising given that this is a one-way protocol. Instead, it's built uh, entirely based on um, symmetric uh, encryption. Um, you know, it supports AES, DES, and a couple of uh, um, uh, proprietary systems that you'd never want to use. Most of them are 40-bit RC4. Um, as well as um, uh, an option to include type one classified ciphers or suite A classified ciphers as they uh, now call them, although uh, I have never seen any evidence in the wild of anything other than AES and uh, DES and god awful RC4 um, being used um, out, out there uh, in the field. Almost everybody uh, on current systems is using uh, AES, DES or, or uh, RC4 in practice. Um, the keys need to be loaded into the radio um, in advance. Um, a, you know, before, before uh, being able to be using them. Um, and the sender and recipient have to share keys because it's, you know, symmetric key encryption. Now, keys can get into these radios in one of two ways. Um, one way is to use a key loading device. So if you look at these, uh, if you were to look at these radios, um, if you have very good eyesight, you can look at mine. If you don't have good eyesight, buy one and, um, and look at it. Um, uh, you can see there are a whole bunch of pins on here. So a couple of them are serial ports that are, go directly into the encryption module. Um, so there's a kind of direct path into the encryption module um, uh, uh, to the key loader um, that can blast key material into the radio. Um, another way to do it is through an over-the-air protocol called OTAR, over-the-air rekeying, in which the radio has an initial key set up for, dedicated to it. It can communicate with a base station to get the current traffic keys uh, to be used um, over the air. Um, and essentially, it's up to um, the radio to have the correct keys that, um, um, that are being used by whatever group they're, they're communicating with. Um, and if you don't have the correct keys, you're out of luck. And if you do, then, then great. Um, now, again, there are no sessions in a communication because this is a one-way protocol. You, you just transmit, you encrypt, and you uh, now can be received by people who have the key material who are tuned to the correct channel. Okay, so that's the kind of security model. Now, that security model means the sender makes all the security decisions. The, receive, the recipient has no role in, the, um, in negotiating with the sender. The sender basically has to um, select uh, encryption to be turned on, and it's up to the receiver to receive. Now, the, this design is intended for public safety users. That is, the people who they were thinking of when they designed this were cops and firefighters and uh, paramedics uh, out there in the field. And the model for them is you want to err on the side of ability to communicate. And so they, they made a, a design decision that actually makes a lot of sense for that category of users, which is that receivers try aggressively to receive. Um, if you send something with a key, and the receiver has that key loaded in their radio, they will demodulate it. Um, if you send something in the clear um, and the recipient is set to encryption mode, they'll demodulate it. So we err on the side of demodulation, and that kind of makes sense because if you know, you're saying, help someone shooting at me, um, I hope my mic wasn't keyed, um, <laughs> help someone shooting at me, um, the, um, you really want people to be able to receive it if your crypto switch was in the wrong, uh, wrong place. Okay, so um, there's no authentication, um, the, um, and there's no protection against um, uh, things like replay or anything like that, because those all require the concept of a, of a communication session that doesn't exist. Okay, so we um, looked at this protocol and we discovered um, a number of um, uh, weaknesses of the design. First of all, it's pretty ad hoc. Um, it, the security stuff is, was clearly grafted on at the end, but interestingly, 
they seemed to make all of the bearer channel encryption stuff does not make a lot of the mistakes that you could make. For example, you know, if you XOR the first frame with the second frame, the key doesn't fall out, right, or, or anything like that. You, so they, they seem to have done the, the actual AES-DES encryption um, reasonably, uh, reasonably competently, uh, with the exception that there's no authentication built in. But, uh, but in terms of actually successfully encrypting when the encryption is turned on, it seems to, it, it seems to actually do that without any embarrassing cryptographic mistakes that we've found yet. Um, uh, you know, I have to add that, uh, uh, that. But it does have some significant protocol weaknesses that can be exploited in practice. Some of them are consequences of the lack of authentication. Um, some of them are consequences of the enormous susceptibility to traffic analysis, which I'll talk about in a second. In particular, there seems to have been a simple mistake made that there's metadata sent that includes a unique unit identifier for every radio. So your radio has a unique serial number that it sends over the air with each packet. If you turn encryption on, that stays in the clear. So even if you're encrypting, somebody uh, doing um, uh, intercept can kind of keep track of what units are in the area when they're on, when they're off, what channels they're on, and, and uh, who they're working um, for. Uh, and that appears to have simply been a design error um, in the way it was uh, constructed. It doesn't appear to be necessary for anything about how the system uh, operates. The second is we found that it was vulnerable because of the way they're doing forward error correction. Radio systems really need some sort of error correction going on. Um, they do something very aggressive in that they error correct every metadata field separately. So we send things like the unit ID, and that has its own error correction, and then we send the what kind of a packet is this, and that's error corrected separately, and then we have the bulk voice, um, and that's um, sent separately. And that turned out to allow for a uniquely favorable to the attacker denial of service attack, where this is the only system I've seen that requires less energy to jam than it does to legitimately use. So usually you want to design a system where you need more energy for, to jam. This actually requires less, and I'll describe how you'd actually do that. So here's some, some sort of, here's the smart stuff we found. Okay, first is that voice traffic is not authenticated. And one of the things is that that, that means is that, um, um, that you can replay encrypted traffic at will. So you might not be able to demodulate it, but you can just grab the RF off of it and play it back, and it will happily do that in the voice of whatever they said. And if you can figure out what's going on, um, you could, might be able to use that to your advantage as an active attacker. Um, another uh, uh, issue is the uh, susceptibility to both passive and act, um, uh, active traffic analysis. So passive traffic analysis is easy because even when encryption is on, the 24-bit unit ID is sent in the clear. But that only works when they choose to transmit. So we also found an active attack that allows you to ping radios to, um, uh, that allows you to ping radios to basically get the, induce them to transmit. And the interesting thing about this is that it takes advantage of the one area of the data service that does actually do authentication. Uh, except this system includes both ACTS and NACS. So if, you, if I send you something, a text message over this, and you have the correct key material to decrypt it, you'll send back an, I got your text message. If I don't have the correct key material to decrypt it, it will send me back a, get lost. Um, you don't have the right key material um, with, a, um, with the unit ID helpfully included. Um, and so what that means is that um, you can create kind of Harry Potter's Marauder's map um, of all of the local law enforcement agencies by simply going down the list and pinging and setting up a little system to direction find and triangulate where they're located. And you can do that you know, with kind of SDR equipment and, and uh, three or four uh, base stations uh, at regular intervals and do it infrequently enough, uh, occupy little enough bandwidth 
uh, that nobody is ever going to uh, notice. Okay, so, um, uh, so that is probably more of a threat for the military users than it is for uh, the local public safety because police cars have like markings that say police on the side and lights and sirens, so you know, where they're located isn't all that secret, but military operations are often kind of concerned with this sort of stuff. Okay, so denial of service was kind of the, the most fun of the active attacks that we saw. Um, and um, uh, so here's basically the idea. Um, so there's this aggressive error correction going on. Um, and, and what that means is every field of the, the 1728 bit uh, 180 millisecond frames, every subfield of that is separately error corrected. One of those subfields identifies what kind of packet this is. One of the types of packets is this is a voice frame. And it basically there's a four bits encoded over, uh, over 64 bits that say, you know, this is a voice frame, this is a text message, this is something else. Um, if the recipient isn't able to decode that frame, they ignore the rest of it because it basically tells you what the meaning of the rest of the frame is sent toward the beginning. Now, helpfully, this frame is sent immediately after a synchronization frame that tells you, I'm about to send you this all-important 64-bit error-corrected field um, that you very definitely want to be able to receive. So you could, in, in principle, um, you know, uh, jam 32 symbols out of 864 symbols and render the entire 864-bit uh, symbol uh, packet um, unusable by the recipient just by selectively at the right time transmitting more energy than the recipient for that brief instant of time. And you know, if you use, do a calculation, that means the energy use uh, that you're using compared with the um, uh, compared with the legitimate user is 14 dBs less than, uh, the, uh, than you're required to communicate. So this is phenomenally awful in terms of uh, traffic analysis resistance. And it helpfully provides a synchronization symbol um, built in for you uh, to use. So we really wanted to kind of implement this attack. And you know, we were thinking about well, how do we implement this? Well, we're going to have to build some sort of SDR, and we're going to have to load some uh, custom FPGA in there in order to be able to get the timing right to decode this um, um, synchronization frame. Uh, this is going to be really expensive. We better ask the NSF for more money so we can buy you know, um, big uh, racks of equipment. And then Travis came along and said, oh, I can do that. Um, and so what Travis did is he took this little device called a Girl Tech um, uh, I, I am me uh, instant messenger, which he observed has a chip in it that does a, uh, um, an over-the-air um, C4FM protocol similar enough to P25 that it can be abused in to decoding it in real time. And then he loaded um, uh, some firmware. This is the same device that a spectrum analyzer, he also built a spectrum analyzer out of. Um, he loaded some firmware into it to recognize the, train, the synchronization train and transmit well above its designed maximum power uh, for uh, the few milliseconds required to jam those 32 uh, uh, symbols at just the right time. Um, now, these devices are kind of interesting. Uh, they were market. Uh, uh, first of all, the chip that you want is called a TICC1110, uh, but the, the chip costs more than these devices do on the surplus market. So you can buy these for about 10 bucks a pair um, on eBay, although after we give this talk, the price goes up a little bit, so you know, wait a little while. Um, the, um, you can buy these things on eBay. The development kit with a sample chip costs about $40 but you can get two of them for about $10 in these. And this helpfully comes with a power supply and a nice purple case. Um, and so we call it the My First Jammer. Um, and um, um, basically, it will uh, look for the synchronization train on a given channel and transmit. Now, that's, um, that's sort of interesting because this also gives you about a 20 dB price advantage, um, uh, assuming that power is money. 
um, over the legitimate user as well. The jamming equipment is both low energy and phenomenally cheaper uh, than this stuff. Uh, and you can imagine sprinkling these around a metropolitan area. Ideally, you'd want to put them near the receivers of repeaters um, so that they just uh, uh, jam the equipment um, so that you can get the maximum energy advantage that you'd have. Um, and this would be a fairly economical uh, thing to do. Uh, don't do this, by the way. Um, OK, so that was one thing you could do. But OK, that just causes havoc. That might not be. Um, uh, you know, you know, turning off your local FBI surveillance or whatever is, a, is, is one thing. But what, another more interesting use of this might be to train your local law enforcement agency that encryption doesn't work. Uh, and so rather than just um, uh, looking for the synchronization train, what we looked for was the synchronization train followed by the packet type that says this is encrypted and only jammed encrypted uh, traffic. Um, and so you can make, um, you can selectively jam uh, only certain kinds of sig signals to train users uh, to, uh, uh, in various kinds of behavior uh, that you'd like. Now we published this paper, um, uh, when we published this paper, kind of an interesting um, uh, side note, we published this paper and at the same time our paper came out, Kevin Mitnick's memoir of his life on the run came out. Um, and apparently, he was back in the old analog days monitoring the FBI people who were looking for him. And they had some encrypted radios um, a, a, as well at the time, although this was before P25. And he was really annoyed when they would switch to encrypted mode. And so he apparently got a, uh, a walkie-talkie, and anytime he saw encrypted traffic, he would jam it. And eventually, he would hear them in the clear say, hey, is it working now? I don't know, there was something wrong with the switch. Um, so it turns out we, um, uh, we had a sort of parallel uh, uh, discovery of the same uh, attack, um, except that we didn't actually go on the run and field this, I will point out. Um, OK, so how does this work in practice? Um, OK, so this symbol uh, is the um, um, symbol on the encryption switch. Uh, as you can see, it's very obvious what it is. Um, so, you know, there are some potential usability problems with these systems. One is that there's poor feedback um, about whether you're encrypted when you're using the radio. <clears throat> um, so basically, the recipient does nothing about this. The um, transmitter makes all the decisions, and whether it is in encrypted mode or not <coughs> depends entirely on the to a toggle switch on the radio. And I'll show you what that looks um, like uh, in a bit. The second problem is that um, the over-the-air rekeying protocol is used to very frequently rekey sensitive agencies. Because we all know that you're supposed to change your passwords more frequently to make them more secure. And that is also federal practice for crypto keys for sensitive agencies um, as well. And the more sensitive the uh, operation, the more frequently they're expected to rekey. Um, unfortunately, the over-the-air rekeying is itself, oh, you are the best person on earth. Thank you, sir. Um, the, um, the, uh, this is not vodka, right? Um, OK. Um, OK. So, Unfortunately, uh, the over-the-air rekeying protocol itself is an unreliable protocol, and what often happens is some users rekey to the new key, while other users are left with the old key. There's no mass synchronization that causes everybody to switch over at the same instant. Um, and so if some users have old key material, some users have new key material, they can't interoperate with each other. Now, there was a famous paper by um, um, Alma Witten and Doug Kygar from 1999 called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. And the interesting thing is that this paper made almost exactly the same observations um, that we made about P25 radio usability, about PGP email usability. And you know, it is almost as if the designers of the system looked at that paper and said, well, we can't give them a monopoly on these mistakes. 
um, we, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to do this uh, ourselves. So here's the um, Motorola uh, XTS 5000 radio, um, and this is how it is set up in uh, clear mode. And this is what it looks like when you're using it in the clear mode. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what the display looks like, and that's what the radio looks like. And on the other hand, when it's in secure mode, that's uh, how you configure it. Now, what's the difference between those two things? Well, there are two differences for those of you who are very sharp-eyed and pedantic. One is that there's this little circle with a slash through it um, that shows up on the display, and there's a toggle switch there with a circle versus a circle with a slash through it. Now, the interesting thing is that there appears to be great disagreement among the users about which one of these means encrypted and which one of these means clear and, or what it does at all. Uh, the only precedent I can find for these exact symbols being used um, is uh, car air conditioner vents for open and closed. Um, but, um, you know, so the metaphor appears to be open versus closed. But on the one hand, the circle with a slash through it might mean don't um, versus the open one meaning okay, go ahead and do. And a lot of people have really said, you know, that's obviously what it means. Whereas other people think, well, obviously this means, um, um, you know, don't means uh, the circle and the slash through it means do. Um, and so there's great disagreement about which is which. But it doesn't really matter because you're talking into a different part of the radio and can't see any of these things when you're actually transmitting. Um, so what happens? Well, it becomes very easy for users of this system to inadvertently use mix clear mode and encryption mode. And we, uh, you know, it's very easy for one user to be in the clear while other users are encrypted. And if they all have the same key material, they're communicating quite successfully um, when they're doing this, just with more people than they think they are. Um, and uh, that happens, um, as we will see in a moment, uh, fairly frequently. Uh, the next problem is this cumbersome rekeying. The over-the-air uh, rekeying protocol um, is unreliable. Users tend not to have current key material. Uh, and there's no real way to ad hoc rekey uh, in the field. Um, and so uh, this is the Motorola key loader. It's kind of larger than the radio. Uh, and they're really expensive and cumbersome. And they erase keys on their own uh, fairly often. Um, and you kind of plug it into the radio to load keys into it. Uh, so that's one way. The other is with this over-the-air protocol. So one of the questions we wanted to ask is we discovered a whole bunch of active attacks and a whole bunch of passive attacks. We discovered ways to jam these systems. We discovered ways to um, see who is where by pinging radios. Uh, and we discovered uh, a number of ways in which encryption potentially could be turned off. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm uh, old enough to have um, been at the Crypto 95 conference in Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, Crypto 95 was particularly notable. Crypto is the conference for crypto geeks. They meet in Santa Barbara, not Las Vegas. They're smarter than we are. Um, uh, uh, every year in August and have a big beach barbecue and give talks. They invited as their keynote speaker a fellow by the name of Bob Morris, he used to work at Bell Labs and then went to work for the National Security Agency. So it was a kind of big uh, coup to get him to come and give a public talk at the uh, crypto conference. And he said he would, uh, and what he talked about was he said, okay, I'm going to tell you, got up on stage and he says, I'm going to tell you NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis. And I got out my pen and everybody said, ooh, NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis. This is going to be good. Uh, this is NSA's first rule of, of cryptanalysis. NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis, according to Bob Morris, is first, look for clear text. <laughs> um, and so, um, we decided to um, uh, take that to heart and see how successful uh, a SIGINT operation is if it simply looks out there for SIGINT. That is to say, we decided to build the wall of sheep uh, at a large scale. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, how much unintended, sensitive 
P25, clear text is there um, in the field. So, um, you know, we don't quite have the resources of NSA, and this was about uh, 2010 that we kind of started to do this. So we were uh, looking at kind of 2010 technology for our uh, model. So one question is, how would you build such a thing? Um, so first of all, you'd need to get some locations to put sensors, to put receivers. Um, and you know, the, um, in, in, if you were a national government, you might put them in your embassies in different places or rent spaces on towers or, or what have you. you know, we just used all of our friends in as many cities as we could find. And that basically means we could find sites in Philadelphia, which is where we are, and we had one up in New York and one in central New Jersey, and we had one in Boston for a while, and Chicago for a while, and Berkeley for a while, and, um, and, and so on. So we just ad hoc picked some the metropolitan areas that we had friends uh, who were good enough friends to say, we're going to put this box with an antenna in your apartment. Don't ask any questions. Um, <laughs> and uh, hook it up to your network. Um, and, um, you know, uh, who said yes. And, uh, and so, you know, we basically built a little monitor, sensor monitoring network um, in uh, these various cities. But the, now the question is, well, what actually should we monitor? So <clears throat> it turns out there are two um, uh, ban frequency bands used by the federal government. We decided to focus specifically on federal law enforcement users um, who are doing sensitive stuff that is not ever supposed to be in the clear. And um, um, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of different federal users. A lot of them are completely unsensitive, right? The post office trucks have radios in them, and they use those frequency bands. But those same frequency bands are also used by, you know, uh, Homeland Security investigations and the Secret Service and the FBI and the Postal Inspector and uh, Customs and uh, all of these other uh, various agencies. So the first task is to figure out what uh, channels they're using. There are about 2,000 discrete channels allocated exclusively in DHF and UHF to the federal government um, in the 162 to 174 band and in the 406 to 420 uh, band. And uh, you know, 12, uh, 12 and a half kilohertz spacing uh, between them. A lot of them are, are not in use uh, in any given area. Uh, a lot of them are used by non-sensitive agencies, but mixed in there are some that are used by sensitive agencies. So today, if we were doing this, what I would do is go and buy a sort of medium-end SDR, something along the lines of a Lyme SDR, get one for each band. Uh, conceptually, that has enough um, output uh, throughput to be able to record all of the spectrum uh, for later offline analysis um, within all of the federal frequency bands. Uh, so to, uh, in 2010, that wasn't quite true. Um, in 2010, that would require, you know, in the north of $100,000 level SDR equipment. Today, it's the south of $1,000 of $1, uh, levels would allow you to just record all of that, uh, record all of that spectrum and pick out the P25 si uh, signals later for offline analysis. This was not practical on our limited budget uh, because actually by the time we started doing this, all our money had run out. Um, so we um, uh, found that the best price performance P25 receiver was a consumer grade um, ICOM software controlled radio uh, called an R2500, uh, sold to the hobbyist market, and it has a P25 board uh, in it. So it's not an SDR, but it is a software controllable uh, radio that has remarkably a remarkably good RF front end um, for our purposes in our frequency band. And so the first thing we did was we configured this to um, identify every channel with encrypted traffic on it. Why we, did we want encrypted traffic? Because those are the channels that have the sensitive operations on them. And then, we, so we actually put two of these in each location. One scanning, looking for encrypted traffic on frequencies we don't know about, and another recording all traffic and metadata on every channel that we did know about, and that would allow us to not miss very much. So this two-receiver configuration, although a bit clunky and suboptimal by modern standards, 
effectively would allow us within a few weeks to discover a large fraction of the channels used for sensitive things and then record basically all the metadata and unencrypted voice traffic uh, that, appears, uh, the, that appears on them. Um, okay, so what did we discover? Um, so basically what we discovered was that with the exception of one agency, um, and I'll leave you to wonder what agency that was, uh, every federal law enforcement agency engaged in sensitive operations has um, a, uh, some unintentionally clear traffic um, every day. Um, and sometimes it's entirely clear, um, and sometimes it's clear mixed in with um, encrypted. Um, and invariably, the clear guy would be the one who is, has the transmissions along the lines of, okay, everyone, here's the plan. Um, and so, um, okay, everyone, here's the plan was one of the most common things that we would record along with, all right, I'm in encrypted mode now. Um, so um, uh, we would actually hear that. And you know, if, if I were less discreet than I am, I would have brought a greatest hits tape of, uh, of, uh, the, of uh, those things, see me later. Um, okay, we, we would get an average of about 30 minutes a day per agency per um, metropolitan area of just unintentionally uh, clear traffic. So how sensitive is sensitive? Um, what did we discover? Well, we actually found kind of some of the most sensitive stuff you could imagine. So we would get um, the names um, and other identifying features, not only of the targets of surveillance, but also of things like confidential informants. Um, so, you know, we would, you know, we would hear, I've got Jose with me right now. He's going to go and talk to the target. You'll know him because he's going to be the guy wearing the white hat and, uh, uh, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, that's kind of useful information if you're the target um, and not so great for Jose um, if uh, somebody uh, picks that up. Um, we would frequently get, um, and we were, you know, it was kind of like having your own private version of the TV show The Wire, which was still on uh, at that time. We would get uh, the wiretap plant that was set up to look at a target would often set up a radio base station and kind of broadcast out a summary of what's going on on the wiretap of the target. So we would hear, you know, the target has just gotten a phone call from, uh, my favorite was an operation in which, um, uh, there was a, the target of the attack was named, you know, some name, like we'll call him Bobby, but uh, he was fencing um, stuff that he was buying with stolen credit cards, and this was a large carding operation. And his fence was named Louis the Fence, which is like the worst criminal name ever. But um, the, um, um, so, uh, you know, we would hear the ongoing uh, narrative of what was going on on the target's wiretap quite frequently. Body wires were often, uh, so when they would wire up an informant, the audio from an audio uh, body wire would often be sent over a, a local tactical repeater, more often than not in uh, clear mode, uh, as well as traffic um, for um, um, things like protective details of uh, uh, dignitaries going all the way up to the president, so Secret Service. Uh, and State Department uh, protective operations. Uh, so, you know, we would, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, during the uh, uh, presidential conventions, we would know the code names of the, of the uh, candidates before they would be, get leaked to the news media. So, uh, you know, we, we would get a couple, the Secret Service would start using them a few days after, a few days before they got made public. And so uh, that was, uh, you know, that was sort of entertaining, but we would also learn like where they were moving to and what the plan was and, and so forth. Um, so we would really hear a lot of kind of some of the most sensitive stuff ever. The interesting thing is we would, uh, and we, it was easy to identify what agency was what because we could uh, direction find to where it was and also different agencies would be assigned different blocks of user IDs 
So we could use the um, metadata to determine what agency uh, was operating on a different channel because that's coordinated across the entire federal government. Um, and um, uh, interestingly, there was one agency that we have never collected a single clear transmission from. Any I guess I've told some people this, but if, any idea? Uh, no, actually, the CIA, um, well, the CIA doesn't operate covertly within the United States, but the security guards at CIA headquarters do. And interestingly, if, you, um, if your car runs out of battery in the CIA parking lot, they will help, the security guards will helpfully um, uh, jump your car for you, but they'll also read your license plate uh, out over their unencrypted uh, channel. So no, not the CIA. Um, yeah, ATF is um, very entertaining. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, the postal inspector. Don't mess with the postal inspector. <laughs> Um, they know what they're doing uh, on encrypted radios. And I actually was wondering about this, and I found out, and I asked a friend of mine who runs the radio system for a police department, he said, uh, uh, and he said, oh yeah, I met the radio guy for the uh, postal inspector, and he was less, just this encryption fanatic, and he basically, anytime they would get a radio, he would take some super glue and glue the encryption switch into the encrypted position. And apparently, that um, uh, continues uh, to this day. And that's why the, uh, the postal inspector's uh, office, don't mess with them. They're, uh, they're, they're serious. OK, so we've found you know, basically what's going on. So we found basically there are kind of three classes of, uh, of mistakes going on here. One is the kind of single user error where the switch is just in the wrong position for one user in a group, and invariably it's the, okay, here's the plan guy, um, but um, um, uh, somebody is transmitting part of the operation. There's also kind of the group error, where you have this incorrect information about what the encryption switch means and what it doesn't. Um, and, um, you know, no, or nobody notices that they weren't. And then finally, you have the keying failure problem, where a bunch of users in a group have one key, a bunch have another key, and the only way they can all interoperate is to switch to the clear, because they're out of sync on their, on their uh, key material. And we found that these three categories of, um, you know, when we would sample what was going on, it was roughly a third each of, uh, of, these, um, uh, of, of, of each of these things. Um, and uh, it, what's interesting is that if you go back to the standards people and say, you know, here's what we discovered about this, they'd say, well, great, it's all working properly, right? Because the standard um, is working according to spec. If you go to the radio vendor, they say, we built radios according to the standard. Um, and if you go to the user community, you know, they say, well, you know, these are the radios that we're able to buy. Um, and if they have usability problems, you know, this is what we're stuck with. We have no real control over what the, the, the standard is. So this effectively ends up being nobody's fault, which is familiar in many security uh, problems. Okay, so um, uh, the, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, kind of observation. This was a great example of things, a security being grafted on later with compromises from the beginning with very predictable consequences. Um, the, um, we're seeing actually to this day, our sensors are still, in most of our cities, the sensors are still running. And what we've seen is that I've gone to every federal agency that we're seeing sensitive clear traffic to. I've spoken to some senior person in charge of their communication system. Which, by the way, those are meetings which are really fun to set up. Um, you know, when, when you call a uh, federal law enforcement agency with lots of body armor and machine guns and handcuffs and you try to tell them that there's a mistake that they're making, it's helpful to have friends introduce you. Um, but, uh, so, you know, I go to some of those meetings with some trepidation, but they're actually very receptive to that. Um, 
But what I found is that every time, I, you know, when I meet with an agency and discuss what their real problems are, and you know, playing the audio is very helpful in driving home um, uh, some, of, some of these uh, things. Um, and in fact, I remember one conversation in which I was talking to an agent, and you know, I was able to tell her how she likes her coffee, um, because I've heard one of somebody getting coffee for her during a surveillance operation. Um, the, you know, the, those, those, you know that, that gets driven home, and what we found is that we would see clear text go way down for about two weeks uh, after um, we would talk to them, and then interestingly, it would go up to a higher level than we had seen before. Why is that? Well, as far as I can tell, it's that you know, the message goes out of exactly what to do, uh, and then um, that message gets a little bit garbled over time, and what people remember is pay extra attention to the position of that mysterious switch, uh, but they don't remember which position it's supposed to be in. Um, and, or they rekey more frequently, which has the effect of taking, making people go out of sync more frequently. Um, and so, um, you know, it, the, these are really fundamental problems that are easy to blame on the user, but um, aren't actually, you know, but that would be a terrible mistake. Um, you know, that would be a cop-out on the part of the technology design uh, of these, that they've made a system that's so much easier to use, uh, to misuse than to, uh, than to use. Um, so, you know, we've developed some mitigation strategies uh, for, uh, for them, you know, which, which, you know, a kind of some set of better practices, if not best practices, but really the protocol itself needs to be, and the usability needs to be redesigned from scratch. So I also spent some time working with the P25 standards people. And you know, as receptive as the federal agencies were, um, this was a remarkably different experience. So I had, had, you know, I had gone to a number of federal law enforcement agencies, spoke to them about you know, what some of our findings were, um, and you know, everybody was very interested and in, you know, at least trying to, to fix the problem. And then I took a trip down to, uh, 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 to uh, Charleston to the meeting of the P25 security working group, um, which consisted basically of vendors and a few assorted others. And um, the um, first thing is I, I spoke to some of the federal representatives and I, I said, you know, this, these protocols, when I looked at them, it kind of looked as if there was somebody from the NSA in the room for the first two meetings and then they stopped showing up. Because all of the language of the standard has words that kind of look like um, good crypto speak. They talk about key material and they talk about initialization vectors and it's, all, it's got all the right Greek letters and everything is, um, looks pretty good, but then everything is just being used a little bit wrong. And they said, oh yeah, that, that's actually exactly what happened, he died. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, that's very sad, um, but it was also very sad for the uh, uh, design of the protocol itself. Um, and basically was never replaced. So they were kind of left going on their own. The standards group itself consists chiefly of vendors, and mostly uh, the meeting uh, that I had with them uh, consisted of the first hour and a half of them taking turns introducing themselves and telling me how utterly stupid and off base I was and how none of this is a problem. And by the way, you don't understand decibels. Um, and um, it, it was it, incredibly, so they would go one after the other and, and just tell me how utterly terrible it was and how awful it was and oh, and by the way, you know, you're immoral because you're making us look stupid um, and, uh, and, and so on. So it was a very, very unproductive start. And then, of course, we retreat to the bar. And that's where all the kind of interesting uh, work got done. And so there's, there's some hope of maybe the next generation, it won't be called P26 because they apparently don't go by ones. So you know, when, when they come up with P45, there's a chance that there'll be a, a clean slate, but it looks as if this particular standard is kind of set in stone. Okay, so what are the overall lessons learned? The first is Bob Morris's first look for clear text, which I thought was this trite joke, turns out to work really well. 
right? Looking for clear text uh, in a sea of ciphertext with the practical things that exist right now is a remarkably productive strategy. Um, and in fact, from the standpoint of the interceptor, um, in the old days, when encryption wasn't available, you'd, um, users of these things doing sensitive stuff had to be pretty circumspect in what they would say over the radio um, because they knew that anybody could listen. Um, now they have what they believe to be reliably secure communication and are much, much more open in uh, what they talk about. At the same time, intercept technology, um, you know, an SDR, you know, an under $1,000 SDR setup is sufficient to capture um, in real time all of the I and Q from all of the raw spectrum in the entire federal um, frequency band and can um, then offline pick out all the clear uh, sensitive traffic um, uh, at your leisure or in real time depending on what your application is. This is pretty much the, you know, a budget equivalent of precisely the sort of package NSA is installing in agencies around the world and the FSB is installing in, uh, in uh, embassies in the US, except that you can do it on kind of a hacker budget. And um, so now we have people who are very confident in the security of their communication and an intercept environment that allows uh, passive intercept uh, to, to happen very cheaply and really quite comprehensively. Um, and so, um, you know, arguably the situation is actually far worse than it was back in the days when, when uh, encryption uh, wasn't available. Um, you know, the, um, uh, you know, I joked that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, I'm looking into whether, you know, bank robbery is more lucrative than being a professor because this, this could really kind of give you a, a leg up. Um, I don't make that joke in the talks with the federal agencies, though. Um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, so that's kind of the, the first lesson. Look for clear text works, and it's a lot cheaper to look for clear text. The second is the sort of crypto lesson, which is that grafting um, encryption and security standards onto a legacy system has a long and distinguished history of failure that is unbroken by our experience with uh, uh, P25. This, um, this really doesn't work. And right now I'm just upgrading our sensor network to capture all of the uh, traffic for offline uh, analysis later, and that seems to be working um, fairly um, straightforwardly. So we've got plenty of time if you want to ask any questions or throw anything or tell me why I don't understand decibels, I'm happy to, but try to use the mic or they'll yell at us. Yeah, just, just come to the mic because it's just. Is, is, there any, is there any audio feedback if the uh, received voice frames are not encrypted? So, so you, you, can, you can configure the radio so that it'll beep on encrypted received or beep on encrypted, on unencrypted received. And there's disagreement about what the beep means. Unfortunately, <laughs> the same beep on the Motorola radios, exactly the same beep is used to indicate low battery. Um, <laughs> so um, it, it, you can't win. Um, and uh, the other question is, um, can you have multiple keys inside the radio, or is it one key for one group? Kind um, of? You, uh, depending on how the radio is optioned, yeah. you, can, um, you can load, I think, up to 64 keys okay. on the radio. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, very cool. Um, in, a, in a case of using AES, if we wanted to mitigate like constant rekeying and all the crap that goes with that, what sort of interval might you recommend? You know, so I, I mean, I think the, it's sort of funny that Federal guidelines basically have them rekeying about once a month for most agencies. And the model appears to be kind of based on this middle, military model in which, you know, some of your agents are being captured by the enemy, right? Um, which, you know, mostly doesn't happen to FBI agents, um, uh, uh, you know, as far as we know. They do lose radios uh, from time to time. But, you know, the, you know, it's about as frequent as losing guns. You know, it happens, but just not that often. Um, you know, and the problem is that if you rekey, 
you're guaranteeing that lots of stuff is going to go out in the clear because the rekeying protocol isn't atomic across everybody. Um, if you don't rekey, you're guaranteed that any of your lost radios will be able to uh, re uh, receive stuff. You know, that's less bad than guaranteeing that everybody is going to be able to receive stuff. So you know, I advocate very long-lived keys, and, um, but getting that practice out in the, in, in the field is, is an uphill battle. Changing federal stand, security standards is a non-trivial process. Yeah. So uh, is the over-the-air rekeying protocol secure, as far as you can tell, like not um, subject to replays? No, it's, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so it's, um, it is vulnerable to an, a, a, a large number of active attacks and, and manipulations. Um, it, it does not appear to be possible to load selected, selected chosen key material, but you can do other kinds of mischief that are just as effective in, in practice. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. I'll uh, see you next time. Oh, and, and I, should, I would be remiss in saying, come to the voting village.